It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 339 of Science on Top. We are back for another season. Today is Monday the 9th of September 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. You can always go to scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to become a Patreon and contribute financially. We are currently in the process of hiring someone to manage guests and bookings. So hopefully we'll be able to have lots of new and old voices joining us in the future. Uh, so your Patreon contributions are helping keep us going, but also helping to make the show bigger and better. So a big thank you to everyone who chips in. Much appreciated. But let's begin with a pretty high profile news story that I think has not been very well covered in the mainstream media. Many of you may have seen the headlines or heard the snippets. A 14 year old British teenager has gone blind because he was a fussy eater who only ate junk food. And predictably, lots of people were quick to condemn the teenager, his parents, society in general. But this isn't a simple story of a bratty teenager who didn't like his greens, is it, Penny? It's not. And I mean, you know, a lot of the headlines were clickbait and I took that bait mm -hmm. and clicked it and I was reading, I'm like, oh, you know, he only ate white bread, ham and sausage, um, this and that. I was like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. They're all He's photos so of chips and French yeah, fries chips and stuff. chips and everything. Yeah. And then you read a bit more and it turns out that this boy has quite a severe eating disorder and that it seems like probably that eating disorder wasn't recognised very early and wasn't treated in a way that an eating disorder, you know, is actually going to be helpful. Hmm. So the way the story was presented is that, you know, poor diet, he's just eating whatever, um, you know, all these really limited range of junk foods, his parents are just letting him, um, blah, blah, blah. Now he's blind because he's deficient in vitamin B12. By the way, some of the articles said, if you're a vegan, like, look out, you might go blind too because... <laughs> well, because actually, just, no, that, that came know. from the, the paper. that this, this is based on a one case study. Yeah. So um, yeah. we don't have a lot of information. But, yeah, I think in that paper they actually had a little stab at veganism. Um, yeah. They said, the condition could become more prevalent in future given the widespread consumption of junk food at the expense of more nutritious options and the rising popularity of veganism if the vegan diet is not supplemented appropriately to prevent vitamin B12 deficiency. Which I think most vegans I know are actually pretty They're conscious really, and aware yeah. of that. You know, anyway. And so a lot of the comments you see on sites are like, oh, you know, in my day, kids just ate what was put in front of mm -hmm. them and we didn't have chicken nuggets and blah, 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 blah. And parents these days and yada, yada. So it was really interesting to read a bit more about this and read about what was actually going on. And so this child has an eating disorder known as avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. This is not being a fussy eater. This is not me going, oh, you know what? I don't really like broccoli and I don't really like squash, so I might have something else instead. People with ARFID or avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, they might experience gagging or vomiting when they try and eat certain foods. It's a severe anxiety about these foods. It's not sort of linked to body image and weight like other eating disorders might be. It's about a fear with, of choking, of dying if they eat these foods. And imagine, you know, if you're physically gagging and choking when you eat a certain food, that's, that's a massive deterrent to eating that food. And so this disorder really restricts people to some very, very safe foods. Now, the boy who had the disorder 
you know, he was, you know, it was identified that he had anemia, he had vitamin B12 deficiency, but the treatment was injections of B12 and advice on a proper diet. So it wasn't recognised that mm. he had disordered eating, not just, you know, Yeah, a it was seen more as an eating disorder rather than a mental yeah. health issue. Yeah, and that's the thing is that, I mean, I don't have citations for this, but I'm pretty sure that um, eating disorders, you know, have always existed. It's just the way that they're framed in society is different. You hear a lot about, you know, teenage girls fasting and having religious ecstasy experiences and and in descriptions that are really similar to anorexia. So I have no doubt that people have suffered from these restrictive food intake Mm. disorders forever. It's not like it's a new thing. It's just that maybe they had really poor outcomes or, you know, managed to survive or no one noticed someone else going blind because people go blind for all sorts of different reasons, you know, or, oh, it's demons inside him. (laughs) Demons, he's got demons. Like, so these things are not new, but I mean, It's just really fascinating the way it was reported as a fussy eater and comments are full of like, oh, you know, I just fed my babies broccoli from the day they were born and I just lightly steam it and they love it and it's parents these days giving these junky foods. This is not about that. Which is not to say that poor nutrition is not not a problem or No, it's not. It's okay to have junk food diets. But I'm not going to start saying to my kids when they refuse every vegetable and ask for clean pasta, which is pasta with no sauce, no cheese. Um, By the way, the pasta is white pasta, not wholemeal. Um, Yeah, I know, right? But I'm not going to say, well, if you eat that, you'll go blind because that's not true. The junk food didn't make him blind. Being a bit fussy didn't make him blind. Most fussy kids I know will be fussy, but then eventually will eat a bowl of peas or something. You know, Mm. over the course of a week, they probably get a balanced diet. But yeah, so it's just fascinating how this disorder or this case study has been um, reported on when really it's more of a chance to raise awareness of another kind of eating disorder that a lot of people aren't as familiar with as anorexia or bulimia. Yeah, that's right. I think this could have been a great way to start a conversation Mm. on how we treat uh, mental illness and how we treat uh, eating disorders and that sort of a thing. But instead, it was just turned immediately into sensationalism and this sort of attack dog mentality of... Mm. Kids these days, parents these days, yeah. and this lazy society where we only eat, you know, packaged processed foods and that sort of stuff. How about we address the actual problem, which is that we don't uh, treat mental health problems the way that we should. We don't yeah. have enough resources towards kids in need of this sort of help. And that's, I think, for me, the real take-home message is that we need to address the root issues. Uh, okay, well, let's move on and... I want to talk about two of everyone's favourite subjects, spiders and climate change. Ugh. <laughs> As if on cue. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, hands up who thinks this is going to be a feel-good story because uh, uh. it's not. Lucas, this is actually an article by Sergio Enriquez, who's the chair of the IUCN Spider and Scorpion Specialist Group Zoological Society of London, which is a hell of a business I title. So. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, right? Imagine if that was their whole domain name. <laughs> giving, giving your email address. <laughs> well, Sergio's written this article for The Conversation uh, all about how spiders are under threat from climate change. And I'll be honest with you, there's a part of me that says no more spiders is a good thing, but I shouldn't listen to that emotional simplistic part of me, should I? It's so tempting to think that. I was watching, I, I just had the TV on in the background on the weekend because I was doing some work for, for stuff and, and just I kind of looked up and there was a show that had come on that was like the some guy who's like, he goes around catching venomous snakes and so forth. I can't remember what the show was called. doesn't really matter. But at one point they're, they're, they're going after, they're looking for a particular snake and they, and they find that apparently the largest tarantula in Australia. Ah, oh, I can't remember what it's called. 
Anyway, a really big spider. And the guy's like, oh, I just want to pick it up and play with it. It's like, why? <laughs> why do you want to pick it up and play with it? I mean, I'm, I've am i I've had a sort of a quite a, a spider phobia for, for most of my life, which only in recent years have I started to, I guess, transcend. Um, and as often is the case for me, it's, it's a matter of learning a bit more about them. And once you learn a bit more about them and find out how incredibly unlikely most spiders are to bite, the spiders that live amongst us in our, in our homes are, uh, I've come to think of them more as little drones that go away, go around taking care of creepy crawlers that we don't want in the house. So there's, you know, they do a, a lot of good for us. And, and, and for that reason, I'm, I'm becoming a little bit less, concerned by them but i still don't like a great big huntsman above my head in the bed that's no. just uh, too much too much but th- that huntsman now will get relocated it doesn't get killed as i as i you know normally would have lashed out so but you're right um this particular story was written by sergio in um response to a paper that had been published which of course the media picked up on and said ah so climate change is making spiders more aggressive. No. Oh. No. I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've got straight to the punchline. <laughs> it isn't. Um, this paper specifically was looking at um, uh, looking at uh, post-cyclone events which were putting selective pressures on a particular type of communal spider. So that sounds like a way less impressive headline. Especially because now I'm thinking of the communal spider. This is the spider we all share, the the communal spider. One spider for all of us. Yes, yes. Come on, your time with the spider is up, Ed. Please hand it over. (laughs) Um, So this particular spider, which is, I'm not even going to try and say it's Latin name, but it's the group living spider, also known as a communal spider. They're often found in groups of a few hundred individuals. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) that is the appropriate response to a few hundred (laughs) spiders you walk into that i mean i I don't know about you but i immediately flashed to like indiana jones you know with the all the tarantulas all over and and i i I remember marveling as a kid how indy just sort of casually reached out and and wiped these tarantulas (laughs) off this guy with his whip as if to say just they're a minor inconvenience oh my god (laughs) <laughs> Horrible. And, and yet, anyway, these... rats and snakes can't handle them. But anyway, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Or well, did he not like rats either? I can't. I, I thought it was just snakes. But yeah, uh, you might be right. There was something about anyway. rats in one of them. Anyway, something about rats. So anyway, they they live in in groups. They often live in groups. They don't always live in groups, but they often live in groups. Now that alone makes them atypical. So spiders. There aren't a huge amount of species that that live communally like this, which is part of the reason why it has this name. Um, but that alone, it, it makes them interesting to, uh, to study, but it also means they're not particularly representative of other spider species. So when you contrast them to over, let's say, over 40, 49,000-ish species globally, um, these are a little bit atypical. Now, each of these particular types of spiders – they are born with a predominantly aggressive or docile behaviour. So that that is defined in the case of aggressive as being more uh, likely to um, uh, share prey, um, to reduce waste. They have a tendency to to cannibalise males and the eggs. Just remember, you know, in the spider world, males are the, you know, Males are as useless as they are in our world. Um, they, are <laughs> less susceptible, they have less susceptibility um, to infiltration by foreign spiders. So aggressiveness is not what you and I would think of as aggressive. This doesn't mean necessarily these, these spiders are on a rampage. Um, they're on the streets of Melbourne, gangs <laughs> of these spiders uh, rampaging through the street. That's not what they mean. These are just basically they've got certain characteristics which the scientists have have categorised as aggressive, as opposed to the docile spiders, which are the reverse. They they basically they're, they're less responsive to incursions by uh, by foreign spiders. They they are less likely to cannibalise eggs. Blah 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 blah. Now, if you consider the pressure that a cyclone would put mm. 
on, for example, a colony of spiders. Uh, we, we've just just witnessed in the in the news over here the you know incredible devastation and destruction from the hurricane that swept through the Bahamas. Um, if you consider trees and stuff being ripped apart and so on and so forth, there's a sudden pressure on spiders that wasn't there before, and it makes sense that these types of behaviours um, that are more inclined to uh, ensure their survival will be selected for. So that's the contents of the study, is in these particular spiders, which are themselves atypical, um, they have a selective pressure as a result of cyclones, which we have categorised as scientists as aggressive behaviour. Media takes that as climate change, which is not a cyclone. <laughs> climate change is causing spiders, as in all of them, to become more aggressive. Gangs on the Melbourne streets and so on. So, <laughs> so well done, so yeah, media. This is yet a, yeah, well done, media. So, funnily enough, I happened to tweet this story, and I have a, a, a you know a, a workflow where if I find a, a scientific story that takes my interest, I save it into pocket, and a series of things occur using stuff which takes the synopsis of the page that I'm sharing and tweets it out with a link with the title synopsis link. Hmm. So Sergio himself oh. responded to my my t tweet saying, no, 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 my argument wasn't that climate change is making spiders, spiders more aggressive. Uh, I, that's not my argument. And I've responded, yeah, I know. I, I'm just <laughs> – that my workflow put in the synopsis, which uh. was straight from your story. So that, that, that bit that you're saying, that's not what I was saying, is what you said in your article as a synopsis because – that's what you then went on to debunk. So anyway, Sergio, thank you. I understood. I, I always understood that you weren't saying that uh, that that uh, climate change is causing gangs of spiders to threaten people on the streets of Melbourne. I, I'm, I'm yeah, with you. You're really running with this Melbourne gangland uh, theme, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> but as you said at the beginning, when you threw to me, the, the it, it is indicative of, of issues that creatures such as spiders are going to face increasingly mm -hmm. as a result of climate change. We know that climate change does not cause cyclones, but it will, as the models have indicated for a long, long time, increase the severity of cyclones, hurricanes, and, and all of the other names that they go by. Uh, it will increase the um, uh, frequency of, of said uh, cyclone slash hurricane slash Typhoon All slash other tornado. Typhoon, <laughs> yes. But tornadoes are different. Hey. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, yeah. But so, so these things are going to impact all sorts of species, spiders included. And spiders is a, is a slightly worrying one, which is what Sergio went on to explain, that if we take out spiders, if we take out, you know, significant numbers of spiders, no matter what their species, that does actually directly imp impact us because spiders are so important for controlling so many insects and so many other things that we would consider pests, particularly if they're in the numbers that they would become uh, without prey. Mm. So it is a problem. It's just not the problem that the media, you know, ran with. Although when you put it like that, so there'll be more insect pests and things, when we're also moving to a eating insects society and we've been encouraged to eat more insects, I don't know, maybe it's still a good thing. I'm please hope I want it to happen. No. <laughs> it's funny, yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I was thinking about exactly that the other day because I was reading a story about a new, there was an exhibition or, or an event or something or other where people could, um, could access uh, insects from vending machines at the event. It may have been in Melbourne, or I may be misremembering that, but it was just in the last week or so, and it was showcasing the future of protein, basically. It was like, well, the, you know, we as a Western society need to kind of get over our ick factor mm -hmm. and and learn to sort of embrace these things. And I was wondering as I was reading, it's like, oh, that, that's great, but what about on a, if, you, if you scale up to an industrial level of producing these types of yummy treats mm -hmm. um, that are that are that come from insects how well can we actually do that in terms of the sheer numbers that are involved to replace you know beef for example 
as as a as a as a fairly significant source of protein in society, in Western society. I don't know. It's it, it made me wonder. We can achieve a lot when uh, there's money on the line, and if you can create a market for it, we'll create a way to farm them. Yeah. So apparently, people were saying who were eating these treats from this. Uh, that you know these vending machines at this event, um, they were just shocked at just how tasty these things were. It's mm-hmm. like, yeah, as long as you, I mean, you you know cognitively you are eating beetles or whatever, but um, this really tastes quite nice. Whatever it is that I'm eating, it's yeah, well in the preparation. I think I wouldn't eat a raw cockroach, but you know a lot of them mashed together into a sort of a hamburger patty and with a good sauce. Yeah, go for it. Sauce is key. Sauce is always the key. Except if you're Penny's children on their pasta. So. No, clean, <laughs> clean pasta. <laughs> All right. Oh, I never thought I'd see the day. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah. So the spiders, we should be more afraid for them than afraid of them as climate change yes. worsens. Sobering thought. But I still don't want them in my house. No. Uh, Let's move on now to Hawaii and specifically the volcano Kilauea on the island's southeast coast. And it's been erupting almost continually, I think, for decades now until about this time last year when one of the craters collapsed, causing the lava lake inside to drain out. And so for several months now, the Hala Mayo Mayo crater has been empty until a few weeks ago when an observation flight spotted something green on the bottom. What was it, Penny? Oh, well, that's the suspense. (laughs) Oh, fine. Um, No, something I always find interesting about volcanoes is it's actually really hard to study them. And every time I've watched a documentary on volcanology, it's always dedicated to the memory of one volcanologist Mm. or another because you can't just go, oh, okay, Let's just walk down and take a sample of whatever this green stuff is. It can't even, it wasn't even an easy thing to like fly a drone over to see what it was because of all the winds and the um, Mm. air currents, plus cultural considerations, natural park regulations and so on. So people flew over this for a couple of times, this green deposit at the bottom of the lake, probably at the bottom of the crater, probably a water lake, but you know, could it be a optical illusion or a chemical deposit until a flight saw reflections and ripples in it we just weren't sure but it turns out it is water and that is interesting because where did the water come from there's two possibilities it could have been from rainwater in which case the lake would be quite shallow or it could be from groundwater so rising subsurface water and that's really important because The way that the lake's formed lets us get an idea of what might happen the next time that Kilauea erupts. So if it was rainwater, it would be probably quite shallow and the heat of the lava coming up would essentially just boil it off. But if it's groundwater, then it could be really, really deep and there could be a lot of saturation of the rock in the water table meters below like tens of meters below the surface and that is interesting because lava and water interact in really exciting ways so (laughs) it depends it depends on the situation so like for example underwater if lava flows come out quite slowly underwater you get these great pillow basalts and so on so it can shape the lava but when it's happening in the context of a volcano it can make for some really explosive conditions. So what might happen is that when it does erupt and the lava that in a dry condition would have the beautiful, typical sort of fiery volcano, it might actually um, essentially boil up its lake instead of just erupting. But boiling the lake creates all this steam, which are making really, really um, powerful explosions that can blow a lot of ash into the air. It can cool down the lava really quickly when it hits there, so make little chunks of lava that would be cooling and getting shot around and so on. So where this lake has come from is actually quite interesting. 
and it probably is a groundwater lake. Um, so it's probably coming from water that's rising below the surface. And like Ed said, it's because um, the crater collapsed. So the lava lake that was there before, so your typical thing that you imagine in a volcano, like a lava lake, drained out. That means that the crater cooled down and instead of just boiling off and dr drying out, the, um, once the rocks cooled down a few years later, the water could actually start to gather there. So hopefully in the end we'll get a bigger lake and then who knows what will happen after that. But if it gets big enough to go there and take some samples, we'll be able to find out a lot about Kilauea and what's going on underneath because there'll be dissolved minerals. We already know that there's a lot of heat there. Um, the, even just the colour of the water suggests that there's a lot of stuff dissolved mm. in it. We might see bacteria growing um, and so on. So I think this is really interesting. There's a bit of a webcam that you can use to watch the lake. Awesome. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's just nice to see this change. I think geology sometimes can feel like a really static science mm. in that you're looking, oh, now this rock is 2.6 billion years old kind <laughs> of thing. And a lot of the really dramatic events, like the formation of the Himalayas and so on, take place on a slow scale. Or it can be really destructive, like massive earthquakes, massive volcanoes. This is a kind of a nice, quick little geology event that's happening that is not particularly destructive yet. It's not particularly slow. It's, it's on a scale that we can appreciate it, we can follow it, we can see what happens, we can make predictions about the future and learn about... Um, the Hawaiian volcanoes. So yeah. I just thought this was really interesting. I just love learning more about what's Absolutely. going on. Absolutely. And, and that's the exciting thing is that now that we can, by studying this, learn a lot more things mm. that we otherwise probably would not have been able to study or learn at all um, yeah. until something like this happened. And so it's a green colour. And mm. you said that's because they think it's dissolved minerals in it. It's not like there's yeah, algae or something maybe, growing there. No, I don't think it would be. They don't think it would be algae yet. I mean, obviously, algae or bacteria Cooked. at least seem to be everywhere. Um, it could be things like sulfides and stuff that are dissolved, mm. giving it these different colours. Very cool. Seen, definitely seen some incredible, uh, you know, high, high mineral content uh, mm. lakes in, in person and in, in photos and stuff like that the where they've got such you know dense um such density of minerals that that's pretty hard for life to to get established there at all so yeah um incredible colors in some of those things okay well lucas speaking of life uh let's move on and there's an article in the atlantic that poses a question that might get captain james t kirk excited what if aliens glowed but obviously, it's not so much about humanoid aliens. It's talking rather bacteria that could have some sort of like a bioluminescence. Is that right? Yes. And and again, you've jumped straight to the uh, the punchline there. But uh, <laughs> yes. That's what I do. Uh, that's your thing. Um, so, okay. So just, just to backtrack for a, li a little bit. We've known for a while that um, there's a lot of brown uh, of red dwarfs in the in the uh in the world and and brown dwarfs these are so red dwarfs are really really small dim uh stars brown dwarfs are sort of considered failed stars um but these these are stars particularly the red dwarfs that are incredibly numerous in our galaxy and throughout the universe one of their defining characteristics is that although they're way less mass than our star, which is a kind of a middleweight, they they burn through their fuel really slowly. So pretty much every red dwarf that's around that was around, you know, in the, the first ones that that ever um, formed, they still exist and will continue to exist for like billions and billions and billions of years. They'll be around long, long after our star has died. Um, they have very, very long lives. So when you consider them as a potential habitable star system, they sound like they'd be 
quite a good place to look because you've got these really long time frames for life to get started and to evolve and so forth. The problem is these same stars, although they burn through their fuel really, really slowly, they're very um, active. They have very active surfaces. They, they continuously throwing out flares of different types mm. of radiation. Um, they tend to blast everything around them pretty, pretty harshly. If you were to put a rocky planet around a red dwarf, which indeed we're starting to find many of, there appear to be, this appears to be quite a common configuration. You put a rocky planet around it, because the mass of the star is so small, for the planets to maintain a stable order, it tends to be quite close to the star, which means it's kind of in the firing line, right? So you get something really close to a star that's low mass, um, if it's going to be in the so-called habitable zone, which is where liquid water could form because the temperature is just right, then it's probably so close to the star that it's being lashed with radiation and also is quite possibly tidally locked, which is when it shows one face to the star all the time, a little bit like our moon does to us. Mm-hmm. So it's not a great you know, confluence of events um, for life to, to persist. It could well begin in that scenario, but it would only take some massive ultraviolet blasts, some X-ray blasts and so forth to strip such a planet of its its atmosphere, um, to pretty much blast all life uh, on that planet in such a way that it, it, it would really struggle to survive. So that's been the kind of the assumption up until now that that although these star systems are numerous, we know that there's a lot of rocky planets around these star systems. We're starting to find that there's quite a few rocky planets around these star systems that are in the so-called habitable zone. The problem is that we don't think life would, if it did get started, it probably wouldn't persist for very long before it got blasted. So this is where a new um, study comes into play, where a group of scientists were considering what type of life on earth is able to deal with harsh intense ultraviolet light from the sun and what they thought of was uh, coral reefs in very shallow seas which glow in the dark so these are using what's called bioluminescent Um, so what they do is they effectively absorb the sun's rays they absorb the ultraviolet and they immediately, they immediately transform that light and re-emit it as visible light. And in so doing, they are themselves effectively immune to damage from ultraviolet light. Isn't that cool? It is very cool. So if we have such life forms on Earth, then this may well be an indication of the type of life that could potentially establish, establish itself on such a planet as in fact is in orbit around Proxima Centauri. So Proxima Centauri is one of the closest neighbours to us. It's very, very close. Um, and, and we know now that it has a, uh, a planet that uh, seems to be in the habitable zone. It's a rocky planet. Uh, it's, it's known as Proxima Centauri B. And basically, it, for all intents and purposes, is the closest planet to us. Now, it is in that type of orbit that it's likely being lashed with with pretty severe ultraviolet radiation but if it did happen to uh, be able to maintain some liquid water on the surface and that's a very big if if you know uh, about uh, water on earth it needs a couple of things it needs the right temperature but it also needs atmospheric pressure because water doesn't like to stay water if it's not if it hasn't got a bit of pressure, it tends to go straight from ice to gas. So uh, if the planet was constantly losing any atmosphere that it had and that it was able to form, if it was losing it too quickly, then that planet wouldn't have enough atmospheric pressure to maintain the water in a liquid state. So it's a big if. But if, (laughs) if, big if, uh, that was possible. And when you start to consider the sheer numbers of planets, we're talking probably hundreds of millions of star systems that are in this type of uh, configuration, then that big if 
suddenly becomes a quite possible if because just the, the numbers are just, just so big. So that means quite possibly there are life forms around some of these planets and even just a small number of those planets, considering the, the mind-boggling number of configurations like this, mm-hmm. could mean that there might be thousands of, of star systems out there with glowing life forms on it. And so I guess we could even then hunt for them, I guess, by looking for planets that we yeah. know are close enough to a sun that when there is those big uh, ejections, those big ultraviolet bursts or whatever, we would then see presumably a brightening of the planet's surface as millions of little bacteria luminesce in response to that, I'm guessing. Yes. yes. Awesome. And and there's a few things about that configuration that would actually make them at least um, theoretically easy to, to spot. Um, such a planet, because it wouldn't have a dense atmosphere, think like Venus, for example, very, very dense atmosphere, Titan, very dense, mm-hmm. dense atmosphere. Um, you can't see much because they're effectively just a cloud, you know, just cloud. That's all we can see um, unless you're using some other, you know, waves of light, uh, frequencies of light that, that are able to penetrate the cloud. Um, so a planet like this would likely have a very thin atmosphere and therefore is not likely to have a great deal of cloud. Now, if you're looking for visible light and there's no cloud, that makes it a little bit mm-hmm. easier to spot. Mm-hmm. Also, these types of planets are actually quite easy for us to spot with the techniques we're using right now because the orbital periods are short. And if the orbital periods are short and the star itself is low mass, which means compared to the planet, the, the mass differential is not so large that the planets actually will start to cause that star to wobble as it goes around it. So we can use that wobble method that we've talked about many times to spot a candidate star. And then we can use the fact that the um, planet that's going around it that's causing the wobble is quite dark because it's a rocky planet. And potentially if it has very little cloud, then we're looking at a dark planet with glowing life on it. So things start to add up to being potentially uh, easy to find. Could we do it now? Not quite yet, I don't think. But if you were to extrapolate out how much life on such a planet would actually glow compared to Earth, it might be a planet that, for all intents and purposes, is covered in glowing light. That's what I was just thinking. If you can imagine just an ocean of bioluminescing creatures, that would mm. be gorgeous. <laughs> that would actually be, cool. be quite beautiful. Uh, so it reminded me a little bit of, of a phase very early in the in in the Earth's history where the predominant life forms were the stromatolites, mm-hmm. and there was a lot of um, there was a lot of shallow sort of uh, rock pool type oceans around the world then, which is where the stromatolites were really able to 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 take to you know to to establish themselves. So um, yeah, I mean it's it's really cool to think about because you know it's. <laughs> I, I just love how things evolve so quickly. You know, you, you someone comes up with an idea and you think, wow, didn't really consider that. And then when you, you plug things like this into something like the, the Drake equation, you know, this is just sure. an always changing scenario of, of, of where we where we might find life. It's and, very cool. And but that's the big question, though, of course, because we're always talking about, you know, well, what are the chances of there being life elsewhere? We only know what we see here on earth we've got this one data point that life looks like this and then you sort of drill down in that but life is so varied on earth when you get tardigrades you get bacteria you get your multicellular um, large creatures plant life that is carnivorous all this sort of stuff there are so many variations on what life is on that one data set that the possibilities of life outside our solar system become that much more uh, significant, I guess, and, and a higher chance because it could be in so many different configurations that we've barely even thought about half of them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I mean, my personal view is that, you know, that there's, there's so many hundreds or billions upon billions upon billions <laughs> of, of planets out there, you know, without a doubt, um, based on the numbers we're starting to see with our planet hunting. It just seems inconceivable to me that not only would circumstance just contrive to to put all of the life that there is on one tiny little rock 
but it will really double down and, and fill every nook and cranny of that planet with different types of life because it's so hard to find somewhere on this planet without life. And we're talking about those, you know, those, um, uh, those rock pools and lakes that are very high in mineral content. Even there, there is still some life. You know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to find an area on the planet that just hasn't got some life. So it just seems so unlikely to me. And we're all, you know, for things like the Drake Equation, which, which you know, tries to estimate where intelligent life may be and why we haven't found it. Um, if you consider that we only need to find one single more example of life beyond Earth and that whole equation changes. Yep. Because we, we, especially if it's within our own star system, oh, sorry, let me rephrase. If it's within our own star system, um, there's always a chance that there may have been like a panspermia type event where life has spread through the, the star system. I mean, that's even possible if it's neighboring star systems, but it's, it's less likely. Um, but if we do find life in another star system, then gloves are off. I mean, that, yep. that's going to mean life's pretty much everywhere. Well, so then the question is, where is the intelligent life? Oh, mm. badumtish. <laughs> and I loved the um, um, the idea that um, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name. The uh, whistleblower from the NSA um, uh, who now lives in Russia. I can't oh, his Edward, name. Snowden. Snow Snowden. Edward Snowden. Yeah, he he actually pointed out he and which which I think caught a lot of the uh, the the. ET hunters out there, you know, the, 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 I don't mean that in a disparaging way, that the, the scientists who are looking for extraterrestrial life, it caught them a, a little bit off guard uh, from what I understand because he said, well, if if there were highly advanced civilizations out there, don't you think their communications, which is the main thing we're looking for to, to, to discover them, would be so encrypted that it would be, for all intents and purposes, indistinguishable from the cosmic microwave background to us? And there was kind of a collective, ah, good point. So what we're actually looking for are potentially radio type signals from civilizations who just happened to be within that sort of 300 mm -hmm. year period where they were using radio frequency transmissions to communicate, you know, because beyond that, we've already moved, we, we've already moved beyond that largely ourselves. So, you know, all that stuff is digital now. You tune a radio into it, all you hear is static. So, unless it's a digital radio. So, you know, these are really cool things to think about. Yeah. And there's no, there's no easy way around it. It's just going to have to be a lot more thinking, a lot more research, and a lot more technological advances before we get any of the answers to these. But they're interesting speculations, that's for sure. More beer, more arguments. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Just, that's just what life on Earth is all about. More beer and arguments. That's, yeah. that's a window into your world, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but that brings us to the end of our show. And as always, all the links we talked about are in the show notes and on the web at scienceontop.com slash 339. A big thank you to all our Patreon supporters. We've been doing this show now for more than eight years and that sort of staying power is really only possible because of everyone who's been to scienceontop.com slash donate and signed up to throw a few dollars our way each episode. So thank you very much for that. And thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. probably already know eating nothing but chips, french fries, and white bread could lead to all sorts of health problems, but scientists in the UK say it made one teen go blind. Doctors knew about the unidentified teen's limited diet, so they told him to eat better and gave him vitamin B12 injections. By the time he turned 17, he permanently lost his vision. Researchers at the University of Bristol say the lack of proper nutrition led to optic neuropathy, which affects the optic nerve. But at least one scientist says the report fails to consider other possible explanations like genetic defects or environmental exposures. Don't look at me.
I. Why are you looking at me for? Because you don't eat vegetables. I mean, I'm um, just saying, like, that is what I've been trying to say to you this whole time. Eat better. Uh, popcorn is a vegetable. It is. You know corn has no nutritional value, right? <laughs> Never mind. That's... <laughs>